Thank you, Barb. OK. Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is our second session today, and we're going to have Robert Radigan and uh, Jacqueline Miller present today um, both on New Mexico population estimates and projections, but Robert here is going to address some of the um, 2020 census and evaluating the count as it as it has come out. And so everything I said yesterday, Robert's going to correct today. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, Robert is the head of the Geospatial and Population Studies here at, at the University of New Mexico. Uh, yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, great to be here. Thank you all for joining. Uh, Susan said yesterday this is her ninth time hosting this conference, which means it's my ninth time in attendance because uh, my first one was the first one Susan uh, hosted. It was also my first day working at UNM. Um, and I want to thank uh, Barb LaFleur and anybody else from the Census Bureau who's with us for their dedication to the Census Bureau's mission throughout a very difficult count with some unprecedented challenges. And I do want to take a minute to um, to recognize Jeff Mitchell, uh, the director of Bieber, who passed away just a few months ago. He was a, a great economist, a great guy, and I'm, I'm going to miss his uh, informative, engaging and, and humorous presentations. Um, as in, and I, I am going to be talking almost exclusively about the 2020 census. And so as, as Susan kind of um, introed for me, the, 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 the decennial census is essential for the population estimate. So that forms the foundation. Uh, any decennial census is the foundation of, of the next 10 years of estimates. And so that's why it's so important to us here uh, where um, as uh, you know, the New Mexico State Demographers Office, where we do produce our own uh, annual population estimates. We're doing population projections, which is just an extrapolation of those estimates. And um, and we're also uh, pro providing valuable input to the Census Bureau and their estimates and, and validating those numbers uh, before they're made public. Um, so this is my outline for today. I'll be talking about the the congressional apportionment data that was covered a little bit yesterday. I'll talk about the various evaluations of the census, talk a little bit about the redistricting data and how that's been impacted by uh, the Census Bureau's disclosure avoidance methods or differential privacy. And then I'll talk about what's coming next and, and uh, tee off Jacqueline with the population estimates. Uh, so the apportionment data released on uh, April 26th. Um, that was uh, April 26th of 2021. That was a, a, uh, there was a statutory deadline of uh, December 31st, but it was a few months late, obviously, due to the pandemic and the delays it caused in the count. Uh, the Census Bureau was not uh, the first federal agency to meet one of the, meet to miss one of their statutory deadlines. Uh, it happens all the time, and this one was for very good reason. Um, so the U.S. saw about a population increase, a 10-year increase, about 7.4 percent. Uh, New Mexico uh, only grew by 2.8 percent over 10 years, which is drastically different than uh, the previous 10 years when we grew by over 13 percent, and the decade from 1990 to 2000 when we grew by over 20 percent. Um, this is due uh, to, to out-migration of, of many New Mexicans into neighboring states and around the country, but also quite a dramatic shift in natural increase. So of declining birth rates, uh, rising death rates due to our aging population. Uh, Jacqueline's gonna talk a bit, uh, a bit more about this uh, in a little bit. But the important point I wanted to make was that if without a change in one of those trends, unless we start to see in migration or a dramatic increase in births, we are, will be, uh, New Mexico will see a decline in population in the years to come. Um, because we have now reached a point where we are seeing uh, more deaths than births. So in the absence of any in or out migration, we are going to have a declining population. So, um, so that's very likely to be the case in 10 years from now. We're going to talk about a, a decline uh, in New Mexico's population. We see here from this map, there were three states that lost population uh, over the 10-year period from 2010 to 2020. Uh, those were Illinois, Mississippi, and West Virginia. Uh, I have a sense that that's going to be, uh, be a lot more than three states uh, after the 2030 census. So New Mexico won't be alone in one of those states that's looking at a declining population. Um, most of the growth happened out west. We see Texas, Nevada, Utah, Idaho, 
uh, in North Dakota with growth um, of 15% or more. Uh, we had some minimal growth in the Northeast and, and, and the Midwest. Uh, these are the uh, apportionment totals. So this is based on a slightly different. Uh, so what I showed in the previous slide was the resident population. Uh, the way that Congress is apportioned, they use a slightly different population total that includes overseas military. So there's an, you know, you might see two numbers floating out there for New Mexico in the 2020 count. Uh, the, the apportionment total included 2,800 overseas residents. Those were uh, military personnel and their family who were stationed overseas. Uh, these apportionment totals also do not include, uh, they exclude uh, the population for the District of Columbia because they do not receive congressional representation. So we see here that uh, New Mexico stayed the same, three representatives in, in the last 10 years. We'll have three representatives going forward. Um, and Texas is the one state to gain two seats. Uh, we had a handful of states gain one seat. Those are the states in green. And uh, California, interestingly, the first time in their history, they actually lost a representative. And we see, <clears throat> excuse me, we see in the Northeast there are a number of states who, uh, who also lost uh, uh, a seat. Interestingly enough, I think the big story when these numbers were released was uh, the, the state of New York, which lost one seat but everybody had them, uh, was predicting that they would lose two seats. Uh, and in fact, they, um, their, their population total was 89 people more than the state of Minnesota, giving them that 435th seat. Um, so if there was any doubt as to the, uh, how useful it is for states to invest in a complete count campaigns, uh, those 89 extra people that got counted uh, which may have been a result of New York's outreach campaign, uh, gained uh, New York an additional seat or prevented them from losing an additional seat may be a better way of putting it. So those are the apportionment totals and let's let's talk about the evaluation or uh, how they're being evaluated so far and what's going to happen next. Uh, important to note that the decennial census is considered the gold standard of population data. Maybe that's not the right term because we're not on a gold standard, but maybe the, the fiat standard just doesn't sound quite as nice. Um, but we, we, so they are the, you know, all population data is baselined to the decennial count, but we evaluate the census nonetheless for um, estimating net error of the census, uh, estimating undercount or overcount of, of various cohorts. Um, note that net error and undercount or overcount are, are synonymous. We're talking about the same thing. Um, trying to assess the impacts of the COVID pandemic and other natural disasters like the hurricane in Louisiana that happened during the count. There were some wildfires out west that displaced a great number of people. Uh, the Census Bureau needs to evaluate the various response modes, you know, the self-response road, the uh, non-response follow-up, that's a door knocking campaign, um, uh, proxy enumerations, administrative records, imputations, and whatnot. Uh, evaluating various census operations for improvement and, and the outreach campaigns. And um, I put here estimating return on investment for complete count committee funding because I've had a lot of questions about that, about, you know, the state of New Mexico inve invested a great deal of money, $11 million into census outreach. Uh, and rightfully so, the state wants to know if there's a return on that investment. Um, it's a very difficult question to answer because you're essentially trying to figure out how many New Mexicans responded to the census because of our outreach campaign, um, uh, how many of those people responded to otherwise would not have responded? It's just it's a practically impossible question to answer, but uh, there are ways to 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 kind of get a handle on that and uh, talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and last but not least, identifying process improvements for the Census Bureau for 2030 so they can do an even better job um, in 10 years. So uh, just continuing along, how do, why these evaluations are so important to our population estimates program. Um, the, as I think I mentioned, the decennial census is the foundation for annual population estimates. Uh, this is uh, the demographic accounting formula. You, you don't need to, we don't need to unpack this whole thing, but the important thing here uh, is uh, if we're trying to um, estimate the population for say 2021 or 2022 or any year to 2030, the the first input in that formula is the population from 2020 so that establishes the base and then we're adding births uh, subtracting deaths and uh, adding net migration so without an accurate population base um, you don't have very good uh, estimates whatever error you carry into that base 
you're going to carry forward to the, for the next 10 years. So it's critical that what well, one we get the count as right as we can, or the Census Bureau gets the count as right as they can, but also that we make some adjustments to that base. If we know that there was a certain population or a certain cohort that was undercounted in the census, there's an opportunity to adjust that base. And, and that's true for the Census Bureau or for the independent population estimates that, that we create uh, here at GPS. Uh, important to note that the Census Bureau, unlike the operations for uh, the actual count and providing the apportionment totals and the redistricting data, which um, is, is guided very much by law, the Bureau has a little bit more discretion with their uh, estimates, me estimates methodology, including uh, how they want to define that most accurate base. And, and the Census Bureau continues to do research into how to establish the best possible base for, the est for their estimates program uh, over the next 10 years. And why this is so important, uh, why the population estimates are so important is because the estimates are the real foundation for the equitable distribution of the $1.5 trillion in federal funds that are distributed uh, to states and local governments each year. So you probably heard a lot about all the money that's tied to the census during the outreach campaigns. It's really the estimates that drive the distribution of those funds, but you gotta get the count right to get the estimates right. Uh, the estimates are also used as uh, rate denominators for all sorts of, uh, of rates, such unemployment, or insurance rate, even COVID vaccination rates. Um, and the estimates are the population controls for the Census Bureau sample surveys, of which there are uh, many, including the American Community Survey, Current Population Survey, and uh, the Household Pulse Survey, and the Small Business, well, no, let's stick with the Household Pulse Survey uh, that we heard about uh, this morning. So, uh, starting now into some of the ways that the census is evaluated first is a demographic analysis. So the Census Bureau uses demographic analysis as one, one method to evaluate net coverage error at the national level. So it doesn't apply to, to states, but it does at the national level and helps identify coverage differentials by race and undercount of young children. Uh, undercount of young children can be uh, estimated fairly accurately using this method because it relies heavily on um, vital records. So we know how many, more or less, how many uh, kids were born throughout the decade. And so does that number match the number of, you know, zero to nine-year-olds that were counted in the census? Um, that's a pretty accurate way of gauging the undercount of young children. Uh, and very important to note that these demographic analysis estimates are independent of, of, of the 2020 census. And in fact, the Census Bureau releases historically and, and, and uh, in 2020, uh, releases the results of demographic analysis prior to releasing results of the census. So, so here in this slide that I copied from the Bureau, uh, we see what the DA estimates for the U.S. population was. They do a low, middle, and high uh, series based on uh, differing assumptions. Uh, and then that is already out there prior to the uh, apportionment totals being released. So we see here that the 2020 count for the US, 331.4 million, fell in the middle of the low uh, and middle demographic analysis uh, estimates. And um, this is, you know, I mean, what, what, about a third of a percent off of the middle demographic analysis series. So remarkably close, not quite as close as the 2010 demographic analysis, which was within a very small fraction of a percent of their middle series, but um, the 2010 census did not have nearly as many challenges as, as the 2020, uh, 2020 did. I'm not going to go into all these points, but I thought I'd include them if anybody was interested in reading them later. Uh, another method that's used to evaluate the census is comparing the state population totals with the Census Bureau's own 2020 population estimates. Uh, it's one of, uh, two, you know, let's say two of the three methods employed by the Census Bureau. Um, the numbers are not quite apples for apples because the decennial count is as of April 1st, whereas the the vintage 2020 estimates are as of July 1st, but it gives us a pretty good uh, gauge nonetheless. And uh, New Mexico's count was slightly over the 2020 estimate uh, by about 11,000 people. So, so if you take the estimates is true. That would suggest 
that the 2020 count was a, a half a percent over count for New Mexico. Uh, but really, when we're talking about you know less than one percent, that's within the margin of error for for the estimate methodology. So um, nonetheless, it just indicates that there was a, a, a good overall count here in New Mexico. Uh, that's great news. I don't want to gloss over that. Um, as you can see, you know, many states are in gray and the gray states are, I don't know how easy that legend is to read. Uh, the gray states were within negative one and plus one percent. And we can see the vast majority of states fall into that area. So this again, suggesting a good overall count, at least at the state that level, uh, and it was a good net coverage. Um, we had six states where the uh, estimates were 2% or no, where, I'm sorry, where the count was 2% more than the estimates, states like New York and Vermont and Alabama, those states in purple. And we just had one state where the count came in less than 2% of the estimates, uh, and that was Arizona. Interestingly enough, um, my colleague in Arizona, uh, the, the state demographer there, he's been saying for many years that the estimates were too high for his state. So he kind of knew this was the case. So um, maybe unpack that over the years and, and all this will help improve the Census Bureau's estimates uh, throughout the next decade. Uh, quickly, a, um, uh, a couple of other evaluations that are, have either happened or are ongoing. Uh, one significant one is the American Statistical Association. So they did an evaluation based on census operational quality metrics. Uh, I probably should have included a link to those. Um, the, the quality metrics, Susan touched on this a bit um, yesterday. Uh, those are, you know, an example of those are the uh, response mode rates. So what percentage of New Mexicans self-responded uh, versus, um, versus answered the door for an enumerator? or were enumerated by proxy or administrative records or imputation. Uh, another example is, uh, Susan asked a question yesterday about the total enumeration rate that rose rapidly in some places where we were coming up on the end of the count. The count ended on October 15th of, of 2020 and the total enumeration rate, which theoretically should hit 100% if, if it's a complete count, um, th those gaps closed very quickly in some places and uh, very curious as to how that happened. And so these uh, these quality metrics help answer that. Uh, important notes about this analysis that it evaluated only the state population total, so not the redistricting data that was released uh, this summer. And the they concluded, um, first they stressed repeatedly throughout the report that the analysis is based on limited data and that we need to see the quality metrics at a sub-state level. I'm gonna talk about that again in a second, why that's so important. Uh, but they did find no major anomalies that would indicate the census numbers are not fit for use for the purposes of apportionment. So that, that's great news. There were a lot of us with the pandemic and the political interference that was uh, that some of us were afraid was happening with the census does not appear that that happened. So it's so the Congress, you know, the, the constitutional reason we do the count um, looks like the, the census was uh, was fit for use for that. Um, they also concluded, the American Statistical Association concluded that there was no evidence of political interference. That's great. Many of us feared that would, that may have happened. Uh, and uh, again, I'm going to stress, as they did, that the, the Census Bureau would really hope will release quality metrics at smaller geographic levels. And the reason this is so important is we can analyze the quality metrics for the state of New Mexico. But if we really want to understand what happened uh, in, in places like tribal New Mexico or our remote rural areas, uh, we can't lump those metrics in with our urban areas. Uh, we, need to, we need to pull those out. So we need county level or smaller level quality metrics if we're really going to get a clear picture of what went right and what went wrong in the 2020 census so that we can improve upon that for 2030. And uh, myself and many of my colleagues are going to continue to push for those uh, small area quality metrics. Um, qu a few more analysis. The Urban Institute just published an interesting evaluation where they projected the 2020 population based on the 2010 uh, census, ran a micro simulation of uh, the 2020 and compared the results. Uh, summary of their findings was that there was uh, likely an overall 
half a percent net undercount of the U.S. population. Um, that's that's not bad. Um, uh, considerable, although considerable variation exists in who is undercounted and overcounted, uh, and those hardest to count in recent decennial censuses were again likely to be undercounted in the 2020 census, which is my concern exactly. That's why I want those sub-state quality metrics so we can get a better idea of what happened in uh, tribal New Mexico uh, and, and all the places that we know have historically been undercounted in the census. Uh, I do want to caution, this is a great innovative study, but it should be interpreted cautiously due to its innovative nature, and there's a, a link there to the study. Uh, the National Academies of Science, the Center on National Statistics, or CNSTAT, they have a panel investigating the census, and there are in some informal working groups that are advising the Census Bureau on their future data releases. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, then the Census Bureau's post-enumeration survey, so that is currently underway. They're in the second phase of surveying 14,000 housing units. Uh, so if New Mexico has a proportional share, we'll have you know, uh, you know a few hundred housing units that will be surveyed. I imagine we will have disproportionately more uh, in this survey sample just because we're such a difficult state to count. I hope that's the case anyway. Um, and here's just a quote from uh, from a recent article on NPR on this uh, on the post enumeration survey. Uh, what was expected to be uh, a month long observation uh, has been extended um, uh, and is now going to go into March. And I do want to note that there are some valid concerns, and I, I think these are recognized by the bureau uh, about how effective this survey is uh, and how we should interpret it. Uh, due to the ongoing pandemic. Uh, you just We have folks who uh, are reluctant to answer their doors during the census. They're going to be reluctant to answer the doors now. Uh, you've had people who've moved since April 1st, and you're depending on people to remember where they were as of April 1st, 2020. So we're talking about 18, 19 months ago. Uh, we're asking them where they lived then, and, and, and not everybody may recall that, especially given the displacement that occurred due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, the redistricting data, so that was released on August 12th, 2021. So prior to that, all we had was those apportionment totals, those state totals. Uh, this data includes population and housing unit down to the census block level. So you can theoretically build any other custom geography, such as you know, school districts or um, census designated places, anything really, since uh, census blocks are the uh, atomic unit for uh, census geography. Uh, we get race and ethnicity details. Uh, those are necessary for enforcement of the Voting Rights Act, which is part and parcel to redistricting. Uh, and there's only two age categories in this data, 0 to 17 and 18 plus, or, or non-voting age and voting age. Uh, and we do get some housing data as far as the occupancy and vacancy status. Uh, what's not included in this data is uh, sex, detailed age, such as single or five-year age groups, uh, and detailed housing uh, characteristics. That's all forthcoming in the next wave of data, which I'll talk about in a slide or two. Uh, note that the redistricting data was deliberately noisy due to disclosure avoidance measures. That's nothing new. There's been disclosure avoidance applied to census releases going back to 1970. Uh, it is particularly noteworthy in this census due to uh, the innovative level, the, the, innovate, the innovation that was used in the disclosure avoidance method, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the next slide. Uh, note that uh, in New Mexico, redistricting is ongoing at the state and local level. So, you know, the state, all the counties, all the incorporated places do have to redraw the redistricting lines. Those efforts are occurring right now. Uh, at the state level, the New Mexico Citizen Redistricting Committee met from July 1st through October 31st to adopt recommended redistricting plans to the New Mexico legislature. So they, the, the redistricting committee, which is uh, proposed three concepts for four legislative bodies. So we have our three congressional districts, we have our 70 house districts, our 42 Senate districts, and 10 public education commission districts. So for each of those four bodies, uh, the redistricting committee recommended three concepts and the legislature is going to meet, I believe, next week to uh, debate and adopt those maps. Informally, it has been said that they will meet beginning on Monday, although I have not seen an official announcement. So they will select uh, one of those maps, or they can draw up their own maps, or they can modify the maps, uh, and those will be sent to the governor. Uh, and hopefully, 
there's some agreement because we've had a history here in New Mexico of the courts having to decide the redistricting plans because the legislature and or the governor have not been able to come to an agreement. And it is not really the place of the courts to uh, decide to define these uh, uh, to define these districts. And that's why the state just in this last legislative session established the New Mexico Citizens Redistricting Committee uh, and, the, and the Redistricting Act so that we can hopefully uh, have a less um, contentious and less political process uh, going forward. OK, the disclosure avoidance, this, this is one that I've been talking about for a few years, and it's very difficult to summarize in a slide or two. It's a very complex topic, uh, ever evolving situation. Uh, but just give the best summary that I can. Uh, important to note that the Census Bureau has a dual mandate to not just publish accurate statistics, but to also protect respondent privacy. And that is um, those two things are in conflict. So if you produce entirely accurate statistics, it becomes easy to identify uh, the the individual uh, respondent. And so uh, the, the Census Bureau for the last few years has developed an innovative disclosure avoidance system based on differential privacy. And that was applied to the August redistricting data. Note that the apportionment data was what those were the true totals. Those were not subject to disclosure avoidance, uh, but this detailed redistricting data was. So much to say about this, but just in one sentence, the, the, it, the important thing to be aware of with this redistricting data is that small area data. It's about, you know, if we're talking about populations of less than 500 people, the numbers should be interpreted very cautiously. I, I don't know how you explain that to say uh, whoever is redrawing the county commission line for Harding County and its population of 700 people. Uh, very difficult to do when each district, I think they have three commissioners, you know, so you're talking about 233 people each. How do you do that when there's so much noise inserted to, to the data at that small number of people? Um, very difficult to do. Um, it, it, it means that disclosure avoidance will not make it possible to determine undercounts for small areas and small cohorts. So we can do our evaluations at the state level and at the county level, or at least the larger county levels like Bernalillo County, Sandoval, Santa Fe, Las Cruces. Um, but it's going to be very difficult to evaluate the census count for our smaller counties due to the disclosure avoidance me uh, measures. Uh, and important to note that the Census Bureau is developing a new algorithm for the forthcoming 2020 census data. So they have spent years uh, tailoring the disclosure avoidance algorithm to the specific use case of redistricting. Um, and they kind of had to put the other data sets aside and they're revisiting that now and, and they made the decision not to sort of continue with the algorithm that was developed for redistricting to basically start afresh. Um, and you can infer from that what you will. Real quick here, Just, Robert. Sure. We do actually have a good question here. Um, okay. Is the N less than 500 for a density per square mile? Um, well, that's a great question, but no, it, it really doesn't have much to do with density. Uh, it just has to do with the way the uh, the algorithm was tailored. Um, I, I'm going to leave it at that because I'm going I'm to botch any further answer, but I'll say density is not a factor. It's just a threshold of, of, of people. So and we have another question that's real good here. During the 90s and the 2000s, uh, the PEP estimates leading to the 2000 and the 2010 census were high compared to census counts, at least for the city of Santa Fe. But it looks like PEP estimates during the last decade look low compared to 2020 census count, assuming there was still some undercount during 2020 census. Is there any idea why PEP estimates and census count actually flipped roles over the prior two decades? Uh, short answer, I don't know. A uh, little bit longer answer is, you know, we continue our um, our county and sub county level evaluations. Um, we're not ready to draw any conclusions on that. S Santa Fe County, I, I believe you said Santa Fe County there, Susan, when you were reading the, the, the City question. City of Santa Fe. City, City of Santa Fe. Okay. Sure. So Santa Fe, you know, it's an unusual place. It, it's got a lot of part time residents and that complicates the count. Um, historically, but particularly during uh, the pandemic, where you may have had um, this is total speculation on my part, but you may have had folks who part-timed in Santa Fe 
uh, who 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 were were in Santa Fe on April 1st, 2020, who may not have been there otherwise because of the pandemic. They escaped from, say, you know, uh, you know, coast one of the coastal areas or a larger city, and and came to to Santa Fe. So so that it very valid question, very valid concern. We're just not ready to draw any conclusions um, as to what may have occurred there yet. And then. I'll just interrupt a little bit. There are two other comments. Um, one, Kendra Martinari says New Mexico count exceeded estimates thanks to Robert and others and their enduring efforts towards a complete count. Uh, well, thank you for that, Kendra. But it was um, I, I played a very minor role in a very large effort led by a, a lot of people all throughout the state, and it was really um, this was a grassroots effort that got that 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 got an accurate count. So uh, I was happy for the part that I played, but it was really you know com local communities, small governments, and nonprofit organizations doing work on the ground and engaging with people that really gave us an accurate count. And then John Shepard, thank you, Robert, for your service on the Citizen Redistricting Committee. Oh, thank you for that. So you're good to go for the next slide. OK. Um, OK, so let's talk about, uh, I, I updated the slide in light of some questions that were asked yesterday morning. So let's talk about local government challenges to the census count. So if there are governments who feel that their community was undercounted, important to note before I talk about any of these uh, anything I'm about to say that the apportionment and the redistricting data will not be changed. These are set and, um, you know, Congress is not going to reapportion and the redistricting won't be done. Um, I should note I've been very wrong in some of my predictions about the census, including that there's no way there would be a citizens citizenship question. There ultimately wasn't, but we came very close. And I was wrong about um, the Census Bureau. I thought they were going to backpedal on the disclosure avoidance measures after they released some of the demonstration data, uh, but they went ahead with that anyway. So don't listen to my predictions, but I'm pretty confident about that top line there that uh, these apportionment and redistricting data are set. Um, but we can change the estimates base and, and the estimates base uh, does is so important for the distribution of federal funds, survey controls, uh, and the other things I talked about previously. So the count question resolution program, this was brought up yesterday, and this has been around for at least the last two censuses. Uh, and it's a program that provides a mechanism for governmental units to request a review of their official 2020 census results. And we saw in yesterday's presentation some, some specific cases uh, in which this could be applied. And um, so, Important, very important to note that the CQR program does not add people to the census. It, it identifies, so, so if there was an individual or a household who simply wasn't counted, CQR is not designed to change that. It's primarily designed to correct errors in geography, where, for example, you have a, a household in, let's say, um, unincorporated Bernalillo County that should have been counted in the city of Albuquerque. So CQR will correct that. They'll take a look and see, did, did we count that household in the right geography? And if not, they will uh, correct that. It's very difficult unless there was a systemic problem or, or, or unless there was more than one housing unit. And let's say you had an entire subdivision tens if not hundreds of houses that got allocated in the wrong place, it's probably very difficult to tell whether that happened or not. And uh, and further complicating, I'm kind of going off of the order of the slides here, I'm just kind of winging it, but further complicating the CQR program in this decade is that disclosure avoidance system that I talked about in the last slide. So if you had, uh, it, it's going to be, if a city, submits a CQR case, the CQR team at the Census Bureau will have to determine if it really was an error, but they will be working with noisy data. They, the, the, the CQR team, to the best of my knowledge, and I could be wrong about this, but I've asked this question uh, directly to the Bureau a few months ago, and my understanding is that very few people in the Bureau have access to the unmodified data, the data that hasn't been subject to disclosure avoidance. So how on earth 
is somebody looking at a CQR case within the Census Bureau supposed to know if that house really was allocated in the wrong place or the, no the numbers just got uh, jiggered a little bit as a result of disclosure avoidance. I, I just don't know how, uh, like I said, I think that the program could identify some uh, very large errors, uh, which I'm not aware of any uh, significant errors in New Mexico other than group quarters, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I'm just not aware of any, um, I just don't know how uh, any successful cases are gonna be filed. Having said that, I want to encourage local governments to, to file these cases if they feel their community has been undercounted. Note that it has to be the highest elect official to the highest elected official to submit a case. So, you know, mayor of the city or the chair of the county commission. Uh, and note that my team is happy to provide technical assistance. Uh, so just reach out to us and we'll, we'll, we'll happy to help with that. Uh, and, and then just the last note here, because it was came up yesterday, you know, I don't know how many cases were submitted nationwide or in New Mexico that's in this file that's down here. Uh, but it, it, the important note is that CQR resulted in very minimal change in 2020. A net total of 527 people were added in just 14 states as a result of the CQR program. And two people were added in New Mexico. I may have misspoke yesterday and say two people were removed. We added two people as a result of the CQR program. So uh, important that the Bureau go out there and talk about this program, but it's important everybody to have to temper their expectations about what this program is, can actually do. Uh, so this yesterday also mentioned was this post census group quarters review. This is a new program because uh, per the greatest impact of the COVID pandemic on the 20, cen 20 census may have been to the group quarters count. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons that 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 I think that that was the case. Uh, I listed some of them here. You had the count was as of April 1st, but people began displacing in March. So you had people leaving large cities like New York in March, even though and the count was as of April 1st. You had enumerators um, had difficulty accessing certain facilities. It's difficult before the pandemic. It became even more difficult during the pandemic. You had nursing homes in crisis. Uh, the homeless count was delayed until September. Um, and the count review operation of the group quarters that my team was supposed to be a part of, we were supposed to review these counts of the group quarters. That event was canceled. So we never actually got to verify whether all the group quarters in New Mexico were counted. So there is a program to correct this. And I think where we're going to see the biggest movement is in the count of college students because they were displaced in March, but the count was supposed to be as of April 1st. Uh, and we know that some of these kids living in the dormitories and even uh, living in the dormitories were um, may, may not have been counted correctly. So I, I'm very confident you're going to see more change in New Mexico's population through this PCGQR, this post census group quarters review, than you will through. Uh, through the CQR program. Uh, the, the, so those are sort of the Bureau's two formal ways of adjusting the count. Uh, there is also a special census. A, a municipality can request a special census. Uh, that program will probably resume in 2023, 2024. It's suspended right now. Uh, but it's important to note that this is very expensive. The municipality has to pay for it themselves and it often doesn't have the desired increase in population. Uh, just like the decennial, you've got to market this and people have to know about it and have to be motivated to respond. And that's not always the case. It's probably less so the case with one of these special censuses, unless you're talking about a really small town where word of mouth can go a long way. Uh, and then finally, I've been criticized for uh, for my mentions of uh, litigation against the Census Bureau or threats of litigation, but it's 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 a very it's a reality. And I'm surprised actually that there hasn't been more lawsuits to date. Uh, so far, the mo two most prominent lawsuits are the NAACP suing over the systemic undercount of the Black population, and Fairline's American Foundation, which uh, has ties to National Republican redistricting effort, has sued over count imputation. So that's another kind of topic I don't have time to get into, but when the Bureau has exhausted all their methods for counting people, they impute remaining people from households they have every reason every reason to believe are occupied, but which the people haven't been counted yet. They impute those populations. Uh, we're talking about less than half a percent nationally and in New Mexico, uh, but uh, the, the Bureau is being sued over that. I think the intent is to remove those people who are imputed. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Went on a little bit longer than I uh, anticipated. I apologize for that, Jacqueline. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, so next up is the the next wave of data, which is the demographic and housing characteristics file, uh, and subsequently the detailed demographic and housing characteristics file. There's a link there to show you the table, the proposed table shells, 
And it's important that actually you take a look at those proposed shells because they are proposing far less data uh, than last decade. So the, you know, the comparable data being SF1 and SF2, they're reducing the number of tables and the number of data points. And that's, that's tied to the disclosure avoidance method, uh, disclosure avoidance method. So the more data you put out there, the easier it is to reconstruct the underlying database and reveal the identity of a respondent. Uh, the disclosure avoidance algorithm for that is still under development, as I mentioned. So that could, uh, that could delay the planned release of summer 2022. Um, but hopefully we do have that data by then. And then uh, last but not least, the, we have the vintage 2021 estimates coming out. So th that'll be within the next week or two. Um, the vintage 2020 